I will use some diagrams, and the handout particularly will uh, help you with respect to some of the diagrams that I use. Let me begin, while you are uh, receiving the handout, by giving you a bit of uh, my own pilgrimage and journey. Born in South Dakota, raised on a farm, farmed uh, for seven years after graduating from college with a degree in agriculture. Um, the wife and two daughters came to Fuller Seminary in 1956 and began to uh, study. My feeling was that perhaps because of my agricultural background, I would uh, be in agricultural missions or something with no idea other than to respond to the challenge that Dr. Charles E. Fuller raised on the old fashioned revival hour on Sunday afternoons uh, we listened to and he said he founded a seminary here in Pasadena, California. I had been looking around after my wife and I made a commitment to, to Christ, uh, teaching in a church, looking around as to what my destiny would be, and I thought that uh, it wasn't uh, really adequate in the end of my life to simply be a retired farmer, though uh, that's a, a worthy uh, goal for many people. But I felt that I needed to invest myself in a different kind of operation, came to Fuller Seminary, I loved uh, theology. Each evening, I went home from my systematic theology class and typed up my theology notes. I still have them in a notebook. My goal was to use those uh, systematic theology notes in my teaching and in my preaching, because I felt that <clears throat> this theology was what uh, was the core of the message that needed to be preached. Well, I graduated in 1959. The next Sunday was installed as the pastor of an evangelical free church in Covina, about 20 miles east of here. There were eight families meeting in a ballet studio. Uh, I was their first pastor. The advantage of a ballet studio is that there are mirrors on all the walls. And as you preach, your congregation is doubled. <laughs> but as you imagine, half of them are facing away from you. And later on, I saw that that's a pretty good metaphor for what it's like, actually, to preach. But uh, we looked around. Uh, we bought uh, five acres of Orange Grove uh, for $8,000 an acre. Uh, I negotiated the, say, the purchase myself with the rancher. We didn't have uh, 8000 a week uh, scare up. So I offered him $5,000 down on a $40,000 purchase uh, for five acres with uh, $300 a month payment and a balloon payment at the end of five years. And he said, we don't need the money, so that's fine. The interest is what we're looking for. I asked him to subordinate one acre free of clear. We weren't even paying for a full acre, but I asked him to subordinate one acre so that we could receive clear title to one acre so we could get a 100% construction loan and build our first building, which we did. So you can see we're on a, a real shoestring even with a, a total capital uh, a cost of $40,000 for the land uh, with eight families that was stretching it for us. I rented the chainsaw and cut an acre of trees down myself and eight of us uh, worked for a year with a building contractor and we built the first building. <clears throat> I was there uh, 11 years. Left uh, after that 1959 or 1970 to go to Scotland and received my doctorate there, came back and been teaching here. This is my 24th year at Fuller. The first few months that I was preaching, I did, in fact, begin to preach my systematic theology notes in one way or another. And the people were very patient and kind. Uh, there is, in fact, a honeymoon period. Uh, <clears throat> don't uh, count on it lasting too long, though. And at the end of a few months, someone came to me and said, Ray, we, we know that you like theology and uh, some of what you are saying we already knew. Uh, some of it we didn't, but in any event, it is not very relevant to us. And I was beginning to feel that myself. I knew they were right. Something wasn't connecting. And what they were saying was, if it's important for us to believe that God is omniscient, he knows everything, that's easy to say. Question is, does he know anything in particular? If God is omnipotent and can do everything, fine, we grant that. But can God do anything in particular in my life? And so all of these attributes of God and everything we're saying about God really remained uh, unconnected to their lives and just kind of floating in midair. I, at that time, was doing a lot of reading. I'd read a lot of Soren Kierkegaard's existentialist writings. I was reading novels. I read all of Thomas Wolfe's novels, You Can't Go Home Again, Look Homeward Angel, uh, beginning to read novels that put me in touch with the human heart and the human situation. <clears throat> 
and then began to realize that the core of the gospel and of our knowledge of God resides in the human person, Jesus of Nazareth. Paul said of him in Colossians chapter 2, in him the fullness of the Godhead abides bodily. So that within Jesus Christ, the human person, the very incarnation of the divine Logos, we have the very inner meaning and character and being of God. So I did an experiment. I said to the people, look, uh, this isn't working, what we're doing. I'm going to start a whole new series from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to start with the birth of Jesus. We're going to follow the life of Jesus through to the end. And we're going to go on the assumption that we have absolutely no knowledge of God except what we would learn by interacting with and discovering and learning who Jesus is as the very revelation of God. I have put everything we know about God on my shelf. Now, if we get in trouble, I know where to go and get it. But for the meantime, let us assume that we start with Jesus of Nazareth as though we knew nothing about God. And our question is, who would God be if the only access to God we had was through Jesus, who said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And that was an interesting experiment, because after even a few weeks and certainly two or three months, it took a year to do that and go through that, people were beginning to come up and saying, this now connects up with us. This is a real person. This connects up with my life, a man who weeps, a man who gets tired, a man who uh, has anxiety and stress. I know what that is. And therefore, this teaches me that God knows something of who I am. But in addition to that, there is within Jesus something of who God is that is very uh, new and, and, and revelational to us, that God is a God of ultimate mercy and grace. And if I uh, am, am dragged by the scruff of my neck before the religious authorities and a text of scripture is used to condemn me, Jesus will be on my side like he was to the woman caught in adultery. When I have no moral standing before the law, Jesus will invest his moral character in me and on my behalf. And he'll stand between me and the text of scripture if necessary. That's what he did. So if you try to use the authority of the text of scripture to condemn someone that God wants to save by grace and renew, Jesus will stand with the condemned person. And therefore, if Jesus is the reality of God, then God stands with us in that place too. Well, this was rather um, incredible. I had not been taught that. Three years in seminary with all my biblical studies and theology, that had not come through to me. It was these people that pulled that kind of knowledge of who Jesus Christ is out of me. <clears throat> it was a small congregation, even after 11 years, only about 300 people. We had um, six former ministers. Two of them had been moral casualties. Others had just been burned out. I had seven PhDs in psychology, Christian psychologists, that had uh, found in some of the more other traditional conservative churches that psychology was viewed as uh, not only irrelevant, but unspiritual. If you really uh, believed the Bible, you wouldn't have psychological problems. And so somehow, or the grapevine, they, they heard about what we were experiencing and doing there, and they came and found this is a place that uh, not only deals with people who are hurting, dealing with people who have wounds and, and, and provides a place of healing and redemption. This is a place of integration. We didn't even know what that word was then, but it was integration. It was the concept that the most uh, spiritual uh, aspect of our life is that we become authentic human beings, that Jesus was not a religious person, and that his, uh, his spirituality was grounded in his true humanity. And that's why when Paul wanted to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, he never talked about religious things. He talked about human things. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's who we are not in church. That's who we are on the way home. That's who we are with other people. This is, this is the, the highest achievement of the spiritual life, is to be an authentic human person, to be conformed to Jesus Christ, who was not a religious person, but who loved God with all his heart and soul. Well, that uh, led to the point where people said, Ray, this is incredible stuff. But how come nobody else is saying it? Is it true? Well, it, to me, I was convinced it was true because it was all discerned uh, out of our uh, serious reflection on the scripture. But I said, I think I need to put some foundations under it. 
And I went to Scotland for that purpose. I had read some of the essays by Thomas Torrance and his incarnational theology and his Christology. And there is where I found my own theological orientation. Since that experience and now coming back teaching, I have discovered some other aspects of what we had experienced, first of all, that give me a kind of theological model. What I'm going to do today is present to you the result of all of that journey and the kind of core of what I'm teaching now in an area of a theology of ministry. My theology, while I teach in the systematic theology department, is really a form of practical theology. Uh, and and uh, I think that that's what all theology really ultimately becomes. I've often said the day you graduate from seminary, all of your theology is historical theology. <laughs> My purpose is to make you theologians in a sense, so that when you graduate, you not only uh, have uh, our students of the history of theology, but you are actually uh, practicing theologians. And I'll show you in a sense what that means. I discovered <clears throat> from Aristotle in his... Uh, writings that he made two he made a distinction between two words the first is the greek word poiesis the second is the greek word proxis now aristotle's concern was primarily for a kind of uh, uh, political theory a kind of way of, uh, of 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 working within the polis p o l i s the the political the, the society where uh, there needs to be leaders. What constitutes an effective leader in the society of people? How does a leader lead? What kind of activity are we about? Poiesis is a kind of action that operates out of a basic design, but it does not include the telos. Now, the Greek word telos has to do with that which is mature. It's a form of perfection. It has to do with ultimate value and character and so on. Paul uses the word telos in uh, Philippians 3. Uh, teliais, as many of us as are teliais, perfect, mature. Not that I'm already mature, Paul says. My, my telos is Jesus. And when I am perfectly conformed to Jesus, I have teliais. I have maturity, perfection. I'm on the way toward that. Now, Aristotle said that telos is not involved in poiesis. That is to say, when the activity has concluded and you end up with a product, then poiesis has come to an end. If you're the builder of a house as a building contractor, you build the house according to the design. Uh, but when the uh, contractor finishes and the building inspector comes out and uh, signs off on the house, the, the building contractor is paid in full. The only liability that the building contractor has is the quality of the work done in the product. If five years after that house is built, people are using the house, that is the ultimate telos of the house, uh, is being used for immoral or illegal purposes, the builder is not liable. You cannot come back and sue the building contractor for the moral character of the people that live in the house. Poiesis, in a sense, stops short of being accountable for that longer range kind of quality of life. Aristotle said proxis is quite different. Proxis includes poiesis. It does include the, the implementation of a design and a theory. But proxis reaches out toward telos and always uh, must be accountable to reach the telos as its ultimate goal. More than that, in its uh, journey and in its process of moving toward telos, the one who is the leader, the one who is doing this, will discover a kind of truth that was not in the design and will make some corrections. At any point in which the activity does not appear to be reaching its uh, purpose and goal, one makes a correction. Even one corrects the design. To simply follow out the design like a building contractor must do, uh, stubbornly, even though it's not leading to the telos, is, is wrong for proxis. The person in proxis is, is liable for and responsible for the ultimate uh, character and quality of the work and therefore must make adjustments in order to, to do that. If I'm an owner builder and I'm building the house for myself, for example, and I start with a design and meanwhile, while the house is being built, we have another child, let's say. Now we need another bathroom. Now we need another bedroom. It's not in the design. 
But because we intend to live in that house and use it for our purposes, we now are free to change the design because we want the house to be suited toward that. That's praxis. Because it starts with a design, but it's always accountable, not just to the design, but to the purpose for it. Now, the biblical text is Isaiah 55, 11. The prophet says, in the name of God, my word does not return unto me void and empty, but it accomplishes the purpose for which it is sent. So the effect of the word of God is as much involved in the truth of the word as its source. For example, as I mentioned in the handout, that if uh, we applied this to, uh, let's say, a theology of preaching, and you say, uh, what, what, is, what is preaching? Is preaching poiesis or praxis? Well, if preaching results in a sermon manuscript, and that the total grade is given on the basis of the quality of the manuscript, and you receive an A on that manuscript, that's poiesis. If after graduating from seminar, seminary, after about five years, you decide you want to have your homiletics professor uh, check on what your preaching is, and you send one of your sermon manuscripts back to your homiletics professor and say, here's a sample of what kind of sermon I'm writing now, uh, what grade would you give it? And the homiletics professor sends back and says, that's still A-level work. That's A-level preaching. The problem is, every time you read, preach that sermon, nothing happens. Nobody's heart has ever changed. Nobody's under conviction. Nobody turns to God. People are not being conformed to Christ. In all practical effect, that sermon is having no effect. How can it be the word of God? Simply because it is constructed according to a design. And so uh, a theology of preaching must be based on praxis, not merely on poiesis. We give an MDiv degree. After uh, three years or, or more, uh, depending upon your schedule. And I've asked our own faculty informally. My faculty won't let me uh, talk to them like this formally, but informally, I ask the faculty, what is our accountability to a student once we give them the degree? What is that degree? Well, it's the result of our curriculum design. I've been part of two long-range uh, curriculum review uh, pro committee process in the 24 years I've been here. Never in any case in reviewing our MDiv curriculum did we bring people back who had been using it out in the church saying, does it work? Not once. We only talk to ourselves. We only ask ourselves, is this, is this, uh, are we having enough church history? If not, we add a little bit more. Every 400 years, you have to have another church history course, right? You can be thankful, at least, that we've only got three so far. Uh, we need systematic theology. We need uh, to study all of the latest biblical scholarship. So each, uh, each year, we keep adding uh, books uh, of primary reading to our uh, courses on New Testament so that uh, we aren't just studying the Bible. We're studying about how people uh, think the Bible is written and stuff. And all of that massive literature must be covered. And so we examine students with respect to the discipline of our scholarship, not to the ministry of the use of the word. If our students five years after graduating with an MDiv degree are, are, are unable to uh, e be effective ministers, they are not only perhaps ineffective at the professional level, they may be uh, spiritual dropouts. They may uh, be moral failures. Now I've asked some of my faculty colleagues, are we accountable for that? And they say, of course not. The day these students receive their diploma at the commencement service, you know, we're done. We get paid to produce a diploma for you. And when your diploma is produced and in your hands, uh, uh, we're like a building contractor. We're not liable for anything beyond that. And we turn back to a new crowd, so to speak. So in one sense, you see, when I look at my own seminary curriculum, it is primarily poesis, not praxis. Now that's unfair because I, I, have, I have characterized it too, too extremely. And yet uh, I think more and more we have got to ask ourselves in terms of our whole curriculum, uh, are we willing to open it up to what I think is the biblical model of praxis? And you look then, begin to look at the ministry of Jesus, you begin to see that his ministry was praxis. If you don't believe me, believe the works that I do. Because the work that I do testifies of me.
And that's the basis by which Jesus, when he saw a man healed on the Sabbath, the, the man in the synagogue had a withered arm, stick out your hand, and the man stuck out his hand. Now, right away, there was criticism. That's doing something on the Sabbath. That is a violation of the law of the Sabbath. Jesus, on other occasions, uh, healed on the Sabbath. John chapter 9, the man who was born blind from birth was healed on the Sabbath. And they accused him, first of all, of being a fake. Or, Were you really blind? And then they found out who had healed him, Jesus. And John 9, 16, uh, they said of Jesus, after he healed a man on the Sabbath, this man is not of God because he does not keep the Sabbath. And they gave themselves permission on biblical grounds to kill him because they could find in Deuteronomy the text where Moses was confronted with a man who had picked up sticks on the Sabbath. And they said, Moses, we found this man picking up sticks on the Sabbath. What should we do with him? Moses said, kill him. And they did. Now, there's a text of Scripture that would say we are authorized to put to death a blasphemer, somebody who violates the Sabbath law of God. And so when these people decided that Jesus was a violator of the Sabbath, they had a text of Scripture. Jesus was executed on uh, exegetical grounds. <laughs> they had the text of Scripture. But with regard to the Sabbath, he said uh, the Sabbath is not... Uh, the, you, a man, the humans are not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for the benefit of humans. Now, the only reason that Jesus said that is because there had already been a healing on the Sabbath. They had the text of Scripture, but Jesus, when he had the man who was healed, blind from birth, he is also a text. So you've got two texts. You've got the text of the healed man on the Sabbath, and you have the text that speaks about the Sabbath, which has priority. For Jesus, the text of the healed man interpreted the biblical text showing the true purpose of the Sabbath is not to maim, not to kill, but is to heal. And so that, for Jesus, became a, a kind of praxis uh, interpretation of the law of the Sabbath. If there had been no healing on the Sabbath, Jesus would not have ever said that. It's not that Jesus got up one morning and said, I've just come to a rather interesting and I think incredible theological truth. Humans aren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for humans. Now let's see if I can't find some place to go out and apply it. No, I don't think he thought of that until he had to. I don't think that Jesus came up with that statement until after some of them had been healed. Because when a man is healed on the Sabbath, then Jesus is confronted, inwardly at least, with the question, is this of God? Is this a work of God? And if he answered, yes, this is a work of God then he dare not use the word of God to nullify the work of God. If this is a work of God, then the work of God interprets the word of God. That's a hermeneutical criterion. That's a criterion by which we begin to interpret Scripture. And the authority of Scripture is diminished when we use Scripture to nullify the work of God. Not everything that works is of God. But if it's of God, it works. Not everything that works is of God. That's why we must be constantly uh, using the theological criterion here. Is this of God? And if it's of God, then we better go back and look at the text to be sure that we are reading the text rightly. When I came to seminary in uh, 1956, there were 292 of us men and eight women. There were two degree programs the BD, the Bachelor of Divinity, which then became the Master of Divinity, and the MRE, the Master of Religious Education. The eight women students were only permitted to take the MRE degree. They were not permitted to take Greek and Hebrew. They were not permitted to take some of the biblical exegetical courses. Uh, they could take English Bible. They could take church history. Uh, they could take, uh, of course, uh, Christian education courses and so on. Now, as I remember it, the 292 of us men, we were fairly comfortable with that. None of us uh, saw anything wrong with that. And uh, the women didn't either because they had been socialized in their churches to expect this, uh, to come here expecting more than that would be rather uh, strange for them. So at that time in the 50s, these eight women came here under the understanding that they, in fact, were relegated to that status and could not ever uh, assume that it could be a pastor of a church. 
There wasn't a single one of my faculty members teaching that had any idea that a woman could eventually become the pastor of the church. They all felt on biblical grounds that was forbidden, every one of them. <coughs> now in the 1960s, more and more women students began to come until there were 30 and 40 of them, 50 of them. And they didn't come and just said, well, we, we're willing to accept, uh, uh, sit at the, the far end of the table. They say, we want to sit around the table of the rest. We, we, our, our churches have sent us here. Our churches have said, the spirit of the Lord is upon you. We are anointed of God to minister the word of God. And our churches have confirmed that and sent us here to get a degree so we can come back and be pastors. What are you going to do about it? Well, the faculty said, well, uh, you know, of course, this, this, we don't think this can be done. This, there's no biblical basis for this. It's never been done. Uh, this is not part of our uh, commitment, and we, we can't do that. And the question kept saying, then, then who is the real authority here, the seminary or the church? Are you servants of the church, or do you set yourself up as an academic institution, like a university, with no accountability to the church? To whom are you accountable? If you're not accountable to the church that sent me here as a woman, saying the Spirit of God is upon me, then to whom are you accountable? Well, they didn't like that question because they knew they were accountable to the church. And so because that question was being asked, they went back and said, well, let's take another look at the scripture. And they went back and said, well, what do you know? Now we see what we didn't see before. Now we see that we can uh, ordain you. We can give you training for ordination. Now we agree, all of us, that the Bible does teach that women can be ordained. Well, you see, if those women had never come, Fuller Seminary today would still be only teaching that men can serve as pastors. Because they were absolutely convinced that was what the Bible taught. Now, did they make a concession to feminist ideology? Oh, no. These women came saying the Spirit of God is upon us. And they, they forced the faculty to say, is, this, is the being anointed by the Spirit of God for service to Jesus Christ and having the gift, is this, is this a work of God? Is this the work of Christ? And some of them said, we think it's the work of Christ. Well, then we better go back and better look at the word of Christ because to use the word of Christ to nullify the work of Christ puts us in company with those who killed Jesus. So when they looked, sure enough, they found that the same Paul that said in 1 Timothy 2, apparently, I don't want women to teach and have authority over men. The same Paul can say in Romans 16, which they had conveniently uh, neglected to use, that uh, Phoebe is a diakonos. She's not a deaconess, as the English puts it. The Greeks had a word for the feminine ending for that noun. Paul didn't use the feminine ending for that noun. He used the masculine ending for that noun. Phoebe is a diakonos, indicating that it very well means that she's simply not uh, a servant. She holds an office in the church of a deacon. Not only does she get to clean up after the communion, she gets to serve it. She's the deacon. Now, our English Bibles uh, feminize that noun, don't we? The deaconess. Why? Well, because most translators are male, I suppose. And there's a bias there that uh, we, we shouldn't have female deacons. And in the same chapter, uh, this woman, Julia Chrysostom, in the third century, 200 years later, said it's a remarkable thing that the Apostle Paul noted that this woman, Julia, is not only an apostle, but she's great among the apostles. She's a super apostle, Julia. Well, that's all documented. It's all in, in, in church history. Now, we have to realize then, you see, that uh, uh, it's not comfortable for the church to have to take the work of Christ and use it as a hermeneutical criterion for the, work of, for the word of Christ. Now, my faculty in the 60s did the right thing, but they failed utterly to see that what they were doing was a major paradigm shift into a whole new way of uh, using the Bible and teaching the Bible. Instead of coming out with a proxist kind of hermeneutic, they simply said, well, in this case, we can find an exception, and yes, women can be ordained. And they went back, back to a kind of uh, uh, use and teaching of the Bible that was not accountable to the work of Christ. 
I have said this openly, and some of my faculty colleagues know it, that I say and will say today, there are truths of Scripture not accessible to the person who's not preaching and teaching it. There are truths of Scripture that are simply not accessible to those who simply study it as a text. Yes, there are truths that the text reveal, but there's another truth of Scripture, which I've said is the effect of Scripture. That's the truth. The healing is a truth of word of God. And John 9 makes that very clear. That the healed man himself is a text of truth. And we must use that in line with the other text and, and see that the work never violates the word, but the work interprets the word. I use this as a pastor uh, without knowing the word proxis, without really knowing what I was doing. When a member of my church, a woman who had been divorced for several years before she even came to our church, had met a man, a Christian man, who also attended the church with her, and we knew them both. We knew them well and knew them both as fine Christians. She came and said, Pastor, I have a problem. She said, I full well know that the Bible teaches that because I am a divorced woman and because I'm not the innocent party, I can never remarry. I know what the Bible says. But Jim and I love each other, and we believe that Jesus Christ is, is, is part of our lives. So I have a dilemma. If I simply abide by what I think the Bible teaches, I have to be celibate the rest of my life because my divorce is a sin which cannot be entirely removed. Oh, I, it's not going to keep me out of heaven. But apparently, I am meant to bear the stigma of this uh, divorce uh, as a second-class person the rest of my life. The grace of God can get me into heaven, but it cannot renew me and make me a new person, even though Paul said that we become new persons in Christ. <laughs> That's another text, though, you see, that you have to keep kind of off to the side. And her question was, where is God in our relationship? Is God with us or is he against us? She literally asked me that. And I said, uh, I think Christ is with you. I think Christ is part of your life. And because you have gone through a, a terrible process of grief and remorse over the failure of your marriages, and you have come to present yourself before Christ, uh, believing that you are new persons in Christ, then I will marry you. And I did. And I did it before the whole congregation. I didn't do it secretly. And at the wedding, uh, uh, I said before the whole congregation, Jim and, and Susan want you to know they have no right to be married today. They have no right to this. They are here uh, because they believe as we believe that Jesus Christ has made them new creatures in, in, in him. That they, this is their first marriage. You might call it a remarriage, but for them it's their first marriage. And it's a marriage that Jesus attends. It's a marriage that, that is the marriage of two people who are brand new in Jesus Christ because he makes all things new. And we are witnesses here not to uh, some exceptional thing. We're witnesses to the first marriage of these two people who are children of God in Jesus Christ. And we're witnesses to the grace of God. This is what the grace of God can do. Now, I, I at that point, knew that I had no uh, safe ground to stand on. Every act of ministry teaches something about God, whether you like it or not. To say no is to say something about God. If I said, no, I can't marry you, then the conclusion is, well, then God uh, uh, is on, not on our side any longer. God's on the side of the, of, the, of the text, not on our side. And I knew that couldn't be true. Kind of interesting, when I was at Westmont College teaching, I had a, a debate with one of our faculty members there who was very rigid on the issue of divorce and remarriage, and the students set us up for a, 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 a discussion on this. And knowing my own experience and position on it, this man had never been a pastor, though he was a New Testament scholar, and he had a firm position. Once divorced, cannot marry a divorced person, uh, and so on. So we had our go at it, and finally a student raised his hand and said, Professor, uh, there was a man in our town that uh, was a minister, and uh, through some domestic quarrel, he killed his wife, shot her. Now, 15 years later, he got out of prison on parole. His wife is dead. He killed her. 
paid the penalty. Can he remarry another person? And my dear professor friend had to say, yes. The implication is, instead of a divorce, kill your spouse. I mean, that's the implication, isn't it? You kill your spouse, you can marry another one. If you're divorced, you can't. And he hated to say it. He, he, you could tell he hated with all of his uh, being to have to concede the point. Now here you see when, when a theology becomes absurd, you have to be careful. And I tried to use the absurdity test for theology. You draw it to its conclusions. You draw it to its tell us. What's the character of your theology? When you are just being uh, uh, committed to a principle and not to the work in the... Now there's no a safe place. Uh, in my book, On Being Human, I tell the story of a man who was a medical doctor whose child, seven-year-old, was hit when he was riding a bicycle. The skull was crushed. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon, he called me to the hospital and said, here's my son, Gary. I've got him on a ventilator. Um, his skull is crushed. Feel it. It's just like a ripe cantaloupe. He said, I can keep him breathing on the ventilator for months. I've done that with others. Don't we believe that he's on his way to Jesus? Shouldn't we release him to be with Jesus? I'd like to pray and then uh, take another EE -E reading. If it's flat, I'm going to disconnect the tracheotomy and the ventilator, and we'll prepare to send him on to Jesus. Pastor, what do you think? Well, uh, I can't say, well, you know, give me 24 hours to call a professor to read some books. <laughs> oh, no. We prayed, and I said, yes, I'm part of it. Whatever guilt there is, whatever wrong, eventually God will say, count me part of it. I'm part of that. There's no neutral place if you're in ministry. At the gravesite, this boy is buried out in Forest Lawn at Kavita Hills, where my church was. He asked the undertaker to open up the casket. He pulled a letter out of his pocket. And he said to all of us, this is a letter I've written to Gary telling him why we did what we did. We believe he's with Jesus. He laid the letter on the breast of this little boy and the casket was closed. Now that man taught me something about uh, uh, eschatology, a, 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 a real eschatology, uh, not just in principle, but one that enables us to uh, not just interpret scripture, but to answer the question, my God, what are we to do in a case like that? But you see, those who are not in ministry uh, can somehow avoid that, uh, what they call slippery slope, see. And I came in 1976, the first uh, theology faculty discussion was over, should we hire a divorced person to be a faculty member? Since 1948 up until 1976, never had the faculty entertained the notion that they could hire a divorced person to be a faculty member. And I sat and I listened to my former teachers 20 years earlier, or my teachers. Now, 20 years later, they're saying, well, now let's see. Uh, <laughs> I think I could find a biblical text that would support a divorce, but not a remarriage. So I, I'm not sure if this man claims that he might want the freedom to remarry. I don't think we should call him because I don't find biblical grounds for remarriage. And I just don't know what to do. And I listened to my former teachers 20 years later. And I raised my hand as a new faculty person said, is this the first time you've ever had to make a decision? I mean, a real decision? <laughs> other than an exegetical conclusion? And the answer was yes. Well, I said, those of us have been pastors, and there were several of us. We all nodded our heads. We had to make that decision years ago, right or wrong. When we voted, they voted to call the man to come. These two faculty persons abstained. My former New Testament professor said, I don't know how to vote. And this man had been teaching people to become pastors for 20 years. When it came to a real decision, didn't know how to vote. Now, you see, that's, that's the proxis aspect of it. That's, that's where uh, I'm going with this, saying that, that uh, if we really look at the principle that the work of Christ interprets the word of Christ, then we stand halfway between where ministry is taking place and where theology is being done. And we can't allow a, a chasm to occur there. We can't simply teach theology on the one hand or the left hand and then the right hand send you over to the ministry division to teach you how to construct sermons with no bridge between.
Ian Pitt Watson was a professor of preaching here for many years, came from Scotland, one of the most internationally renowned preachers, uh, a Scottish preacher. He preached the Bible through year after year. All he could preach, all he could teach is homiletics. If he were to offer a course in New Testament, which he'd been preaching for 20, 30 years, because he doesn't have a PhD in literary criticism, they wouldn't let him do it. Some of the people teaching New Testament and Bible have never preached it. Here's a man that preached it for 20 years, but he can't teach the Bible to preachers. You see how structurally uh, uh, dichotomized we are between theology and praxis? And, and uh, praxis, then, is a concept that's not just the act which God is revealing God's self to us, in which we then come back and interpret Scripture. Uh, before we break, we'll take a few minutes here. I'm sure there must be some question about this, some, some uh, scary part of it. It's, it can be scary, isn't it? People say, that's all very subjective, isn't it? To, to think, what's the work of Christ? Well, there's nothing more subjective than to use a commentary. You want to preach on a text and you want to be sure because you no longer remember your Greek and Hebrew. The day I graduated from seminary was the peak of my knowledge of Greek New Testament. Uh, <laughs> never in my lifetime. Well, I know as much Greek as I did the day I graduated from seminary. So here I'm out there. Uh, I can hardly you know, make my way through the Greek New Testament. Kind of hopeless for me. And I want to I'll look at the text. So I, I, I pull out some commentary, Dan Hagner, uh, and book on Matthew, another uh, scholar on Matthew. I have two or three texts from Matthew, uh, commentaries, all by evangelical Orthodox theologians, and they don't agree. The best I can figure out when they do use the Greek words is they don't agree about what they mean. <laughs> But I've got to go before the congregation and say, thus saith the Lord. I can't go and say, well, now I've been doing some research, folks, and, and I'm going to lay out for you. Uh, I'm like Fox News. I, re I report and you decide. Uh, I'm going to tell you what Hagner believes. I'm going to tell you what somebody else believes and uh, uh, send you home with that new information. And you make your decision as to what you think the Bible teaches. Oh, no, you can't do that. You can spend two years writing commentary. And yet, the people that preach the scripture can't just preach your commentary. Yes, it's helpful. I read commentaries. I get some insight. You know, biblical scholarship, I view, is to keep from making a fool of yourself. Beyond that, it's the scripture that teaches you, tells you what to preach. Um, well, uh, I asked the question. I answered it. <laughs> Uh, some, when I talk this way, say, well, okay, uh, Ray, what about, let's say, homosexuality? Got a couple of homosexual people, gay men, living together. The Spirit of Christ is upon them. It's obvious to me. I, I have members of my church. Homosexual, spirit of Christ is upon them. They didn't claim that homosexuality was God's preference, but they said, here, I'm a sinner. Is there room for sinners in this church? I said, there better be. Otherwise, I'm be the first one out. Spirit of, of Christ is in their lives. Does this constitute the work of Christ and thereby a hermeneutical criterion to say, well, therefore, homosexuality, same-sex relationships should be viewed at the same level as heterosexual? Is that a good question? Okay, here's the answer. In, uh, in my book, The Soul of Ministry, uh, I discuss this. Pages, I think, if I recall, 124 and following. And what I do in The Soul of Ministry, I establish what I call, first of all, a historical precedent. A historical precedent is this is how we've always understood it. This is how we have always done it. Circumcision, for example, uh, is a historical precedent. And when it came to recognizing the uh, spirit of Christ upon uncircumcised Gentiles, Peter, for example, with the Ethiopian eunuch, baptized him and went back and said, who could forbid baptism? 
because the Holy Spirit came upon him. So I baptized him. Did you circumcise him first? No. And Peter had to make a defense of that. Paul went out with the Gentile churches and saw the Spirit of Christ coming upon uncircumcised Gentiles and admitted them fully into the body of Christ without circumcision. And of course, that was a scandal to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who believed that circumcision was a necessity because it has a historical precedent from Abraham on. Now, for, uh, for Paul, he had what I call eschatological preference. Eschatological preference. Now, the eschatological preference is the, uh, the, the, the work of the uh, coming Christ in this contemporary situation by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit. So that when the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of the resurrected Christ, comes upon an uncircumcised Gentile, that's the eschatological reality that circumcision has come to an end. Therefore, Paul said at the cross, when the circumcised male Jew died, circumcision came to an end as a criteria. The historical precedent no longer exists because the eschatological preference overrules it. Now, you see this with regard to how they selected the replacement for Judas. Acts chapter 1. There were 12. Now there's only 11. Obviously, we, we have got to add one so that we now have 12 again, so that uh, we're just like it was before. Who is going to be the 12th one? So they set up their own criteria. He had to be somebody who had participated in the ministry from the baptism of John to the present time of crucifixion. Had to be a believer during that time. That excluded, for example, the brother of Jesus, Judas, uh, Jesus, uh, James, who later on became head of the church. But at that point, James was not qualified because he and his sister and other brothers were not believers that he was the Messiah until after the resurrection. Obviously, they had to be male, right? It's not said, but it's obvious that the three finalists were male, circumcised, Jewish believers that Jesus was the Messiah. They narrowed the list down to three and then said, okay, now Jesus will give you a chance for the last three. So they cast lots, but they'd already narrowed the field. So they cast lots and Matthias was chosen. Now you never hear of him again, right? You know, not that he didn't do anything significant. You never hear of Matthias again. Meanwhile, the resurrected Jesus is out hunting down Saul of Tarsus. And he finds Saul of Tarsus out here persecuting the church, persecuting Jesus, and he encounters him on the Damascus Road. And by the way, Saul of Tarsus is the only human being that's ever encountered the, encountered the ascended Christ. All of the other witnesses to the resurrection encountered the resurrected Christ, but not the ascended Christ. Once Jesus ascended into heaven, there's only one person that's ever met him on this earth, and that's Saul of Tarsus, right? Stop and think about that. When Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, begins to list all those who experienced the resurrected Christ, 500 at one time, and he adds himself as one out of time, kind of, out of sync. He's not just the last one, he's the first one of the new age because he encountered the ascended Christ who's at the right hand of the Father, not merely the resurrected Christ who hadn't ascended. So Paul himself argues for that eschatological preference. That's his criterion. He has no letters of a credential. He doesn't fit the history. There's no historical precedence for Saul of Tarsus to be an apostle, but there's an eschatological one. And Paul is always conscious of that, eschatological preference and, and accountability. In uh, um, 2 Corinthians 4, for example, uh, uh, first, pardon me, 1 Corinthians 4, Paul, of course, is having to argue for his uh, uh, authority. And he says in 1 Corinthians 4, Think of us in this way as servants of Christ, stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any court. Who are these people judging him? They are the Christian Jews, the circumcision party. On the basis of historical precedent, they're saying, Paul, you have no right to be an apostle. 
And what you're teaching is contrary to what we practice. Paul said, it doesn't bother me a bit that you are judging me. I'm not accountable to you. I do not even judge myself. I am not aware of anything against myself but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Now, if you were to do a quick little exegetical study, who is the Lord that's going to judge Paul? Well, it's not the historical Jesus. He never knew him. Who is this Lord? You continue reading. He says, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before their Lord comes who will bring to light. That's an eschatological uh, reference there. When the Lord comes at the end, everything I've written is going to be examined as to see whether it's true or not. Now, don't, if you bet against me, be sure you're right. But just because I'm an apostle and have written these sacred texts does not mean that I won't have to submit them to a final exam. Paul has a final exam over his letters. Isn't that incredible? Maybe you don't understand the text that way. I do. Paul said, it's not enough that I think I'm an apostle. It's not enough I think I'm right. I think I have the mind of Christ, but that's not enough. Eventually, it's the Lord who will certify what I'm written. And therefore, be careful. Because everything that we say and do, all the judgments we make will be uh, submitted before the judgment seat of Christ, and he will then decide that. That's eschatological preference. It's revealed in the present time through the Holy Spirit. So we've got historical precedence. We've got eschatological preference. We've got a third thing, which I call a biblical antecedent. Now, an antecedent is uh, that which uh, re you refer back to. Uh, if, I, if I say, he met Christ, The word he, as a pronoun, is ambiguous until I say all. Oh, the antecedent for the pronoun is Saul, the noun. So an antecedent is what something refers back to. For every aspect of eschatological preference, for every new work that the Holy Spirit does, there must be a biblical antecedent for it. And Paul is very much aware of that. So charged with the fact that he's teaching now uh, that the Holy Spirit coming upon uh, Gentiles is an eschatological event and therefore not subject to the historical criterion of circumcision, Paul has to have a biblical antecedent. He's aware of that. And where does he discuss that? Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> when was Abraham circumcised, Paul asks in Romans 4? Before he was declared righteous or after? Well, it's clear. You go back to Genesis 12. Abraham is declared righteous by faith before God. Then he is circumcised. So you see, Paul says, you don't have to be circumcised to be declared righteous. He's got a biblical antecedent for the fact that prior to circumcision, there is the righteousness of God by faith alone. After circumcision is over, there is still that same righteousness of God. So he finds a biblical antecedent for what turned out to be a rather dramatic eschatological act of the Holy Spirit superseding the historical precedent. How about what we call remarriage, which I argue is, is not a remarriage. It's the first marriage for two people in Jesus Christ. It's their first marriage. Is there an antecedent for the marriage of a male and a female? Of course there is. Genesis. Two, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. A monogamous, heterosexual union called marriage is established at the start of creation. So a man and woman coming to be married, having by the grace of God been relieved of uh, and freed from uh, the torment and pain and guilt of the sin of divorce, are being married by the eschatological event of God's presence with them and has an antecedent in marriage itself. What is taking place here eschatologically and the marriage of two people who have been divorced is an eschatological event. It's an eschatological event. It's not found in some historical precedent where you can find an excuse to do it. That's why I say you have no right to be married if you've once surrendered. The, what about same-sex relationship? Where is the biblical antecedent 
for a same-sex relationship. I can't, I've yet to find it. Even if you set aside all of the so-called texts that speak against homosexuality, and whenever same-sex is mentioned in the Bible, it is always mentioned as a negative, not a positive. There's not a single instance of an antecedent of a same-sex relationship being blessed of God. And even the ones who make the strongest arguments say the Bible is silent concerning homosexuality. I debated Jeff Syker, professor of New Testament at Loyola Marymount on the floor of Presbytery a couple years ago. Jeff is a PhD graduate of Princeton Seminary and ordained Presbyterian minister who argues very strongly that homosexuals should be ordained. Now, how does he then, as a New Testament scholar, handle all of the so-called texts about homosexuality? He said they are all culturally biased. They have no reference at all to present-day committed homosexual relationship. The Bible is silent, he said. I stood up on the floor of Presbytery and said the silence is broken in Genesis 1:26 and 27. For the sake of argument, Jeff, I said, I give you the fact that those texts aren't relevant. But here is a relevant text. And you may choose to disagree with me, but there's where our disagreement is. Not about homosexual texts. The fact is that Romans 1, 20, or Genesis 1, 26 and 27, the image of God, you've made the male and female, says to us that male and female is God's preference uh, with regard to the full manifestation of the image of God. Marriage isn't a necessity of an image of God, but it's a possibility. But whoever marriage is a possibility is, it is determined by the fact that we are differentiated male and female. Now, uh, Therefore, my answer to the question, well, what about the work of Jesus Christ in the presence of homosexual persons? Does this not then overrule what the Bible says about homosexuality? My question is, isn't a matter of a work of Christ overruling something? Where's the antecedent for it? You won't find in the Apostle Paul any teaching and practice by, in the power of the Holy Spirit for which there is not a biblical antecedent. That's why, you see, this propsis theology I'm teaching you forces us back into the Bible even more strongly than uh, uh, other, other people use the Bible as proof text. We've got to use the Bible here in, in a, as a kind of a theological exegesis. Uh, okay. That was a question, yes. All right, good question. Your question, as I understand it, is, is the case I used of a couple who weren't Christians and were divorced uh, before they became Christians, and because they became Christians after their divorce, they became new persons and therefore are married on that basis? Or was it the fact that they were Christians and then divorced as Christians? And it was the, the latter. And that is, here's a case of two people who were Christians, married as Christians, who were divorced. You see, it's irrelevant to try to use the casuistry of saying, well, if, you're, if you uh, want to do something really bad, you, you do it before you're baptized because your baptism. There were people in the medieval church that delayed baptism so they could have their fun. Because once you're baptized, you know, can't get away with it. Well, that's absurd, isn't it? That's the test of absurdity. No. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, marriage, uh, first of all, doesn't belong to the church. There's no such thing as a Christian marriage. There are marriage of people who are Christians, but marriage is given by God to humankind. Marriage doesn't belong to the church. The church is not the custodian of marriage. The church has a responsibility to enter into human marriage, to bless it and to sanctify it in a sense, and to assert that this, this marriage truly uh, is a marriage in which Christ participates, but not because they're Christian. It's because Jesus Christ in his grace uh, justifies us while we are yet sinners, Paul says. Uh, let's take a break, and uh, we'll come back in uh, about uh, 10 minutes or so, about 25 to 11. And if you have questions then, you can bring them to me.
and uh, biblical antecedent. It came up in the break. Somebody said, well, what about polygamy in the Old Testament? Uh, where jo Jacob, for example, uh, produced um, 12 sons through four women. God accommodated to that. Uh, that's an example of not biblical antecedent, but of historical precedent in that fact that polygamy then uh, had a precedent there in the culture as a result of the fall. The, the, the biblical antecedent is not merely an instance of something in the Bible. It has to be, have theological content to it. And you go to the theological content of a biblical antecedent, you're forced back to Genesis 1 before the fall. In the image of God, he made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They become one flesh. Theologically, that's a statement of monogamy, not polygamy. So it indicates that the biblical antecedent uh, uh, has to have a theological content to it, not merely an instance where God accommodated. For example, um, Paul circumcised uh, Timothy, but refused to circumcise Titus. Now there's a case of pure expediency. Paul accommodated uh, to uh, the desire for circumcision on the part of some in order that Timothy's ministry could be more effective with circumcised Jewish Christians. With Titus, the content of the gospel is at stake. So there again, you could look to the circumcision of Timothy and say, isn't that a biblical antecedent? No, it's not. You have to apply a, a rigorous theological critique here of what we mean by antecedent. An antecedent must be an instance where God established something as true and of what God's preference is. So that same-sex relationships do not constitute um, a God's preference in a sense and where they exist, uh, and they did obviously in the culture of the Hebrews and the Greeks, uh, we would say it's, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the historical pattern there. Now I wanted to then um, just stipulate that again, uh, that language might be unfamiliar to you. Uh, if you're interested, further reading on it in my book, The Soul of Ministry, pages 124 and following, I discuss virtually the things that I have presented here. Now the other second diagram you have has to do with going back into the Old Testament to establish a kind of uh, biblical model for what I call this proxis-based ministry. This is uh, set in the uh, situation of the exodus from Egypt. When I talk to pastors often, I ask them uh, in doctor ministry courses, uh, where's the theological beginning point of the Old Testament? Now, they're smart enough not to uh, pop up and say Genesis. They, it's not that easy. But they've not thought about it that way. So there's usually a long period of silence. If it's not Genesis, where is the theological starting point? Well, if you think about it a bit longer, it has to be Exodus. Because at Exodus, the name Yahweh is given for the first time in human history. That's only about 3,500 years ago, more or less. Prior to the Exodus, the name Yahweh was not known. God says to Moses, I will now be known by the name Yahweh. Prior to that, I was not known by that name. I was known by Elohim. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not know God as Elohim, or as, as Yahweh, but only as Elohim. Now, what's the meaning of the name Yahweh? God says, now, Yahweh now, I'm going to reveal myself as a God of mercy, compassion, and covenant love. I'm going to liberate my people from Egypt. I'm going to bring them out. I'm going to make them into a new people. I'm going to show you. What kind of a God I am? So that the name Yahweh discloses to us the innermost being of God, not as simply, uh, God, as simply a God of power, but a God of love. A God of such love and grace that even though Israel rebels, God will refuse to give up on Israel. Uh, will a, will a, a parent uh, give away their children? And uh, the answer is many do. God says, yet I will never give up on you so that the Hosea book is an is a, elaboration on that God's uh, covenant love, which never forsakes the object of love. Now, the word Elohim and the concept of God is Elohim does not yield that content. So Yahweh is the self-disclosure of a God, of a God of, of grace and covenant love and mercy and long-suffering. Now, the context in which that uh, grace of God that led to the liberation of the people, 
uh, is in the context of what I call the ex nihilo. Now, ex nihilo is not a word or concept found in the Bible, except in the apocryphal literature. It's in, uh, uh, I think, first or second Maccabees, that God is said to have created ex nihilo out of nothing. Now, the model for the concept of ex nihilo is the powerlessness, the weakness, and the barrenness of uh, the people. When Moses then experiences the sheer power of God, which causes Pharaoh to let go of these people, uh, Moses then is instructed by God to think backwards to the very beginning of the human race and to write the story of creation from that perspective. Now, Moses has a whole oral library of tradition. He's got oral uh, stories of tribal chieftains among them, the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why select Abraham out of this oral library of resources? Why Abraham? What's distinctive about Abraham that, that, that places Abraham in the eyes of Moses at the very forefront uh, of that tradition, even though Abraham didn't know Yahweh. What's it about Abraham? Now think of this model. Is it because Abraham is such a, a person of strong faith? No. Why Abraham? Think of the model. The self-revelation of God in Yahweh it takes place in the context of powerlessness. Moses is 80 years old at the time that God calls him to go back, say, let my people go. Moses, for 40 years, is a fugitive from Pharaoh. Uh, he's a failure. He, uh, at the age of 40, tried to liberate uh, a Hebrew. He killed an Egyptian, and he's been fleeing ever since. He's hiding from the Egyptian, from Pharaoh. So uh, Moses himself is powerless. He has no power. Whatever power he had, he used it up and failed with it. He did have power at one time. The people are powerless. There is no infrastructure there of a civil government and with these slaves. Pharaoh has ruthlessly subjected them, stripped them of all dignity and power. These people uh, have no power. So why Abraham? Why is Abraham powerless? Yes? Sarah. The reason that Abraham is in the story is only because of Sarah. If she wasn't barren, it would not be Abraham. Sarah is the theological core of the story, not Abraham's faith. It's Sarah. Because Sarah represents the necessary condition for grace to be revealed. Uh, God gave a promise to Abraham, but Sarah's barren, so they conspire, the two of them, and Hagar's introduced. She is young and fruitful and fertile, and therefore to that union of uh, Abraham and Hagar is born Ishmael. Now in the story, as you read that chronology, it's uh, 13 years later, when Ishmael is 13 years old, that God comes back and said, I haven't forgotten my promise. Your wife Sarah will conceive. Well. Abraham must have said, I don't understand. You know, it's already taken place. Here's my son. He's from my loins, you see. This is Abraham's son. And in that historical tradition and context, that's good enough. It doesn't matter which woman. In that culture, it matters which man. God says, no, it does matter which woman. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. No, said God. Abraham says he's 13 years old. He's almost as tall as I am. I have taught him every night by the campfire. He is the word of God. Then unteach him. Unteach him. You're wrong. For 13 years, you've been wrong. Wipe it out. Doesn't count. You and Sarah have to come back and, and turn toward each other and have uh, physical intercourse in order that out of that barrenness and that hopelessness, that impossibility, something should be uh, uh, created that's totally of God's grace. Now, if Sarah had been in her 60s and conceived, women would have said, oh, that's so unusual. But I remember my mother talking about a case. Oh, no. God has to delay until that barrenness is final until there's no possibility, until there's no exceptions. It has to be that this conception takes place in a barren womb to show that that's a work of God. It's the grace of God. So the grace of God presupposes barrenness. 
presupposes powerlessness. The grace of God must first kill before it can make alive. Whatever we put up as our Ishmael, God will set aside. I think sometimes we can start out with an Isaac and it later on becomes our Ishmael. And uh, when God wants us to take it to Mount Moriah, uh, we're not ready to do so. Think of that incredible thing of how Abraham was able to take Ishmael or Isaac to Mount Moriah, as it were, and put him to death. Hebrews 11 tells us how Abraham was thinking. Abraham at that point had a theological paradigm. Though he was as good as dead, the author of Hebrews says, and that's because he's married to a barren woman. He's as good as dead because he'll have no seed. Nonetheless, they believed God, and to that union was born Isaac. And when God asked him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, he did not stumble in unbelief, but he took Isaac up and to offer him, believing, said the author of Hebrews, that he would receive him back from the dead which in a figure he has come. Now, as we know, of course, Isaac literally was not killed, though, in fact, the knife was raised. Uh, but what's that strange verse in Hebrews, which in a figure he has come? You see, for Isaac, uh, the coming back to life on Mount Moriah will be the second time of coming back from the dead. The first resurrection from the dead was in the barren womb. And therefore, Isaac is now uh, God's problem. Isaac is God's child. And therefore, to offer up God's child from which he came from a barren womb out of grace, who Abraham believed he'd come back again. If God can create Isaac out of a barren womb, God can bring him back from the dead. And the author of Hebrews says that's what he believed. But you see, belief of Abraham is not simply uh, a groping in the dark or a leap over a chasm. It's not blind faith. It's a faith informed by a theological paradigm. Faith must be grounded in an insight into how God works. Because if God works in such a way that God creates out of nothing, then when we come to our own nothingness, our own hopelessness, then God creates out of that something. If we come to a time of barrenness, we must embrace it with promise. You preach promise to barrenness. There are many churches when they think that they're going to go into a barren period, they call in a church growth specialist and they jumpstart the church, keep it from dying. Carl Barth said the problem with the church today is unwilling to die in order that like a kernel of grain it may be raised again, raised again from the ground. But you see, uh, there is a kind of barrenness that when the church enters into it, that's the period of preparation for the Isaac to be born. So you embrace that barrenness. You don't try to uh, jumpstart around it. You don't, start, you don't try always to avoid barrenness. If barrenness comes, you have to understand it theologically. Not all barrenness is of God. Not all barrenness is fruitful. But whatever ultimately comes as fruit from God comes out of barrenness. Comes out of our saying, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. I'm, I'm bereft of any righteousness of my own. When Paul came to the barrenness and hopelessness of his own righteousness, then the righteousness of God through Christ made him a new person. So here again, there's that inner logic that went clear back, you see, to Adam and Eve. So in the creation story, you have in Genesis 2, the reiteration of this kind of proxis theology. Genesis 1 states the matter of fact. And the, God created in the image of God, male and female, on the, the sixth day, after the animals were created. So we have uh, the fact of the matter is God did it this way, Genesis 1. Now Genesis 2 is inserted, I think, as a theological story uh, to answer a theological question, is it possible that humanity has the power within itself uh, to construct and to arrive at a divine image? Is a solitary human person capable of being in the image of God, having all kinds of religious power? This Hadam creature in Genesis 2 had a relationship with God, had uh, power over the animals, could name the animals, had everything at his disposal, and yet says it is not good. So in the Genesis 2 story, there is a theological verdict rendered, not caused by sin. There's no sin in Genesis 2. It's not good. What's not good? You've got this Adam creature who is only partially human, not completely human. There's something missing. 
And God says, let's find it. And they bring the animals up. Contrary to fact, you see, in Genesis 1, the animals are all created before Adam. So the Genesis 2 story is a theological story that has the freedom to place the creation of the animals as though that's a solution to the human dilemma. It's not. Yet there is not found, the text says. Well, what they were really looking for, they're looking for this counterpart to the human. God cannot be the counterpart to the human, nor can the animals be the counterpart. Only another human can be the counterpart. And therefore, this Hadam creature is rendered powerless, is put to sleep. I think there must have been a terrible sense of despair before this Hadam creature is put to sleep. God comes and says, you know, it's not good for you to be alone. Uh, I think this creature must have said, I'm sorry you told me. I mean, I was getting along pretty well. I liked it here. And God says, don't worry, I'll fix it. So God created the absence of that which is necessary by saying it's not good. Now there arises within the heart of this person an anxiety. Well, wh where is this that's necessary? The naming of the animals led successively to failure. Each n animal given a name fails to respond. So the despair is intensified. So the, the continued search simply becomes more and more desperate until finally God comes and there's no animal. And I said, well, where's the next animal? God said, there are no more. We're in an end to that. And the last conscious thought of this Saddam creature must have been utter despair and utter hopelessness. Not because of sin, but because in the story, there's a God-created necessity of our human partnership that unless that's there, we are incomplete. Now, when the Saddam creature emerges out of that sleep, can you immediately say, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh? Now, Phyllis Tribble, in her book, God and the Rhetoric of Sexuality, she's a Hebrew Old Testament scholar of Hebrew. She says it's interesting and significant that the Hebrew word for male and female is not used in Genesis 2 until both are there. That the, uh, the name Adam is not the name of a perfect male. This is not Adam, like John and Steve and Ray. No, this is not Adam. A perfect male, it just lacks a housekeeper. No, she said, he is not yet a human male. May biologically be male, as other creatures are. And the, the, the name Hadam is a play on words, she says. The word for earth is Ha'adama. And this is Ha'adam. So she, because this is really literally earth creature, earth creature. Only when there is a female is this now ish, because there is isha. So ish, isha, male and female, emerge simultaneously out of nothing. You see, this paradigm that grace presupposes barrenness, grace presupposes nothingness, is not because of sin. Grace is not the remedy for sin. Grace is the inner logic of God's creative word. All that exists, exists by God's grace out of nothing. When sin enters in, sin attempts to insert the Ishmael. Sin attempts to, to determine for, its, for ourselves who we are. And that must be put to death. The fig leaves that we put on must be stripped off. We must be, uh, again, unclothed before God as Adam and Eve were, and then reclothed by him. Now, I argue then that the whole of the Old Testament is, is built upon this theological model. You can use this to, I think, interpret Genesis. This is why I argue that Genesis 1 and 2 has a literary theological structure of unity. Uh, I'm not compelled or, or satisfied to, to accept the literary hypothesis that Genesis 1 and 2 have totally different authors. I think it's in this model eminently reasonable to assume that the author of Genesis 1 and 2 in that tradition comes out of the Mosaic uh, period in which you have this paradigm established so that Genesis 2 is inserted by the same author that wrote Genesis 1 uh, to be sure that there's a theological core to the creation story that's grounded in redemption. So that Moses knows God, first of all, as redeemer before he knows God as creator. It's Yahweh that teaches us who Elohim is. 
the Psalms start out, many of them, know ye that the Lord is God. Now, in English, the word Yahweh is usually translated Lord and the word God by Elohim. So the Hebrew literally reads, know that Yahweh is Elohim. That's irreversible. You can't develop a, a theology of Elohim and then add Yahweh to it. All of our theologies of Elohim must be put off to the side. We must start over again with Yahweh. Yahweh teaches us about Elohim. That's why theology is to take the Greek word theos and attach logos to it, the logos of theos. Christology is the logos of Christus. All theology should then start with Christology, not theology. Because how else uh, do we have a, a starting point? The theological starting point in the Old Testament is the book of Acts. I mean, the, the of Exodus. The theological starting point in the New Testament is the book of Acts. If you have a, a person that's become a Christian and said, where should I start reading the New Testament? Give them the book of Acts. Don't give them the Gospel of John. The book of Acts. Because the book of Acts, it reveals the, the fact that it's the resurrected Christ that uh, uh, transformed these people's lives. And after everything that happens in the book of Acts is finished, only then are the Gospels written. Paul has finished his missionary journey. Luke has written about it, recorded it. Paul dies. Then Matthew, Mark, and Luke set out to write the story after it's all happened. So you start with, with the work of the risen Christ in Acts, and then you that leads you back into the Logos that was with God from the beginning and has become flesh. So if you start with John, you're starting with a kind of philosophical uh, paradox, how a divine being can become a human being. You start with the book of Acts, you start with the reality of a resurrected, ascended Christ and the Pentecost event and the power of the Holy Spirit. Then you work backwards from that. Now, when you come then to the New Testament, then the second diagram on that page depicts for us the same kind of uh, inner logic. The ex nihilo in the Old Testament was the barren womb. The ex nihilo in the New Testament is the virgin womb. So the virgin birth of Jesus is uh, a, not a dispensable myth. It is the essential theological core. Thomas Torrance at Edinburgh, I remember him lecturing and coming to the story of the virgin birth, said not only do we have to believe this as a historical, uh, truthful event, but we have to say it's a theological necessity. If Jesus is not born from a virgin, uh, we've cut the core of our uh, knowledge of God. That he's Ishmael, he's not Isaac. So that the virgin birth story theologically is necessary. Now, you cannot prove anything by the virgin womb. It's the resurrected Christ and the empty tomb. The empty tomb is an experience that made the virgin womb credible. Don't try to make a person believe the virgin birth until they have accepted the reality of the resurrected Christ and the empty tomb. The tomb is not empty and Christ is not raised. A virgin birth is nonsense. The disciples, he asked them about a virgin birth before the crucifixion of Jesus, do you draw the blank? Because Mary uh, never mentioned it. Luke tells us she kept it all in her heart. Suffered the stigma of having an illegitimate child. How could she, how could she, she can't prove, you can't prove an a virgin birth. You can't prove that, that the Holy Spirit conceived in her womb. There's no proof of that. The resurrection can be demonstrated. Jesus walks around, he eats with his disciples. They go look at the tomb and sure enough, it's empty. Feel his hand, the nail prints in the side. So you've got the objective, physical, historical reality of a resurrected Christ in an empty tomb. Now you go back, of course, a virgin womb, sure. Incarnation, the virgin birth is, 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 is not a major miracle once you've had a resurrection. And remember that it's the resurrection in the empty tomb that certified the story of the virgin womb. And that's important apologetically for us because often we try to convince people, unless you can believe the virgin birth, you don't have a good Christology. And I say, as a pastor, I say, hey, you forget about the virgin birth not important. What about the resurrected Christ? 
you know the resurrected Christ. Let's, let, let's get involved the resurrected Christ. And when that's true, then the virgin birth uh, story can be added, but it is not essential that you believe a virgin birth. What's essential is you've encountered the risen Christ. And we must remember that because there's a kind of a, a theological apologetics that always wants to start with God and with miracles to try to prove intellectually something without experientially experiencing it first. So Jesus then, you see, as the incarnate word of God, reveals God constantly. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Every act of Jesus' ministry is a revelation of God. If you don't believe me, believe the work that I do, because the works that I do testify of God who works through me. But simultaneously, there's a ministry of reconciliation. So our theology of ministry now emerges out of the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is one who serves the Father on behalf of the world. And that's not reversible. Jesus does not serve the world on behalf of the Father. It's not the needs of the world that pull Jesus into ministry. Jesus only goes into the world when he's sent. He serves the Father. He's obedient to the Father. He worships the Father, prays to the Father. He is the true diakonos. His kerygma, his preaching, is to proclaim the Father. He's the true disciple, the true apostle, as Hebrews says. He's the primary apostle. His ministry of healing is all, you'll see the glory of God if we heal. Every act of Jesus' ministry was to reveal the power and the glory of God the Father. There isn't a single aspect of ministry that belongs to the church that's not already taken up and completed in the life and ministry of Jesus, objectively. Now, Jesus sends us into the world on behalf of the Father, uh, and on the behalf of Jesus in order to do that ministry. Jesus, you see, when Lazarus, his friend, is sick and dying, and the two sisters send for Jesus, they assume that the love between Jesus and Lazarus is the connecting cord that will draw him into ministry. Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick unto death and dying, and you have the pills in your pocket to cure him. And he did, but he didn't go. We must do the works of God when it is night, daytime, the night comes when no one can work. They thought that by appealing to his love and, and their need, they could draw him in. Not so. Jesus does not have to love Lazarus more than the Father loves Lazarus. It's God who loves the world and sends his son into the world. So when Jesus goes, he goes not because he's drawn there by a compelling need and by his own uh, gifts. He goes there because he's sent. And when he comes, he's greeted uh, sequentially by each of the sisters who in turn said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And they're right. Twice he's confronted with that devastating critique. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. And they're absolutely right. He just got there too late. Now, you haven't become a minister until you've gotten there too late. You haven't really become a minister of God until you realize that uh, in people's minds many times, God gets there too late. Where was God when I was abused as a child? Why didn't God come in time? Where was God when I needed God? Now, you've got to be prepared for that. Now, Jesus never defended himself. Jesus didn't say, well, you have to realize, Mary and Martha, of course, I've got a lot of other cases. I was making hospital calls. I have these other things. You wouldn't believe my email. Uh, no, there's no excuse. God has no excuse for getting there too late in our eyes. But then he says, roll away the stone. And they try to stop his ministry. No, 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 don't, don't touch the stone. Why? Because it's too late. By this time, he stinketh, says the King James. <laughs> Leave the stone there because by this time, he stinketh. And they try to stop his ministry. But Jesus prevails. And he says, now you'll see the glory of God. Roll away the stone. And Lazarus came forth. Now, if Jesus had gotten there within 24 hours and said, roll away the stone, and Lazarus came walking out, they would have said, well, we thought he was dead. He looked dead. But I guess he wasn't really dead. No, God knows how easily we will explain away the grace of God and put an Ishmael in his place. God waits until he is stinking dead 
And, uh, you know, that's a parable for us, that we always want to get there to prevent the death, don't we? We always want to get there to prove that, yes, I'm the healer. Yes, I, 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 I'm, the, I'm the one. No, we, we oftentimes will be viewed by others as getting there too late. But we have to realize that getting there too late is only a perception from this side of darkness. That once Lazarus comes walking out, uh, that's the healing of the accusation and the pain of getting there too late. Once there's a, a resurrection, once it's alive, it's incredible how the accusations fall away because now he's back again. And they call the names of everybody. Let me take this one step further with the third diagram, what I call crystal proxis. Remember that it is uh, not everything that works is of God, and not all proxis is the proxis of Christ. We have to have what we call crystal proxis. That is, uh, it's, it's the, if, we, if we marry this couple as the proxis of Jesus Christ, we have to be sure that the spirit of Jesus Christ is present and at work, and we must be able to discern that. In the first century, we have this crystal proxis taking place as a Trinitarian form of ministry that God is the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, so that we have the threefold ministry of God at work in the first century. Christ is the telos of that ministry in terms of being raised from the dead. That's the, that's the end of the age. That, that's the completion of everything. Now, the risen Christ through Pentecost sends the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes uh, to join with us on our journey toward what I call the last century. Now, the last century is the century in which the end of the world occurs, in which Jesus comes the second time. If uh, Jesus comes and this world ends before January 1st, we're in the last century. If not, then this next century, the 21st century, could well be the last century. The last century is not the previous one. The last century is the one that is really the last one. Now, again, theologically, we understand that our uh, mission is not to recreate the first century church, but to formulate, under the power of the Holy Spirit, the last century church. The last century church is going to look quite different than the first century church. The first century church still struggled with the overlay of historical precedent. Male-dominated, issues of circumcision troubled them. Uh, even through the centuries, historical precedent continued to trap the church uh, in the grave clothes, so to speak, of its origin, where the freedom and power of the resurrected Christ still struggle to be free. But as the last century emerges before us as the coming of Christ, as Paul said, then when we look around, we'll see that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, neither slave nor master, that these old distinctions are going to drop away. And the closer we come to the last century, the more we should see the eschatological preference at work over and against historical precedent. Therefore, the task of hermeneutics uh, and how we read scripture is the task of crystal praxis. The day that you leave seminary and go into ministry, or if you're in ministry right now, you should be doing crystal praxis. That means that uh, you stand with two texts. You stand with the text of the healed person on the Sabbath, and you, you stand with the scripture text. So that uh, hermeneutics itself is not simply a function of scriptural interpretation. Hermeneutics is an ongoing process by which those who are in crystal praxis, ministering the presence of Christ in the real world, began to use the text, apply it, and interpret it. You cannot take simply uh, something that works and, and, and set it over against and set aside Scripture. We must always come back to Scripture. Scripture is our sole authority. But the sole authority of Scripture points to the fact that the Spirit of Christ, as Scripture says, is at work in the world. My model is dependent solely on the authority of Scripture. I have the authority of Scripture of St. Paul's words himself, that we will all be judged by the coming Christ. My model is solely based on the authority of Scripture. It's Scripture that compels me to believe that the Holy Spirit at work today is the spirit of the resurrected Christ objectively, not subjectively, to produce what uh, uh, we must uh, understand as to interpret. So uh, crystal praxis takes the word of Christ and the work of Christ and interprets it in such a way that it continues the ministry of Christ.
Now, what this looks like, finally, then, is that last diagram where I try to uh, draw this out with some further implications. Again, we have the first century with the Trinitarian model there through resurrection and Pentecost. Uh, we have this radical uh, break. Uh, in the first century for the incarnation, there was only one body of Christ, and that was a Jewish circumcised male, Palestinian culture. That's the one body. It's the only body that, that, that God dwells in. God literally dwelt in this one body, his body. Now, to try to, to uh, draw out uh, the criteria of his body, such as maleness, circumcision, cultural factors, and make those normative for the ongoing ministry is to uh, fail to realize that the cross cuts right through that. With the cross, all of these criteria came to an end. The old humanity of Christ gives way to the new humanity of Christ. Now, uh, our body, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as Paul says. Therefore, under the law of the Spirit of Christ, Christ's body is anybody. Anybody is uh, uh, the bearer of the uh, Spirit of Jesus Christ, male or female, Jew or Gentile. So that this model shows us that we are continuing to struggle from the liberation from the provincialism of this historical precedent. And to argue and say, well, if Jesus had wanted women to be ministers, he would have had a woman disciple. If Jesus had wanted women to be fully uh, equal with men, uh, the incarnation could have taken place in a woman. Well, it could have. Why then? did the uh, incarnation take place in a male? One good reason may have been to nail somebody to a cross <laughs> to show that's the end. That's it. Whatever male prerogatives you had based on your biology, based upon your role in the culture, they came to an end on the cross. The best way to, to uh, take all of this patriarchal, hierarchical, male-dominated culture and put an end to it is for God to assume the male role and reduce it to absolute powerlessness. Crucify it. Now, uh, that makes sense to me, even as a male. If, in fact, God had become incarnate in a woman, it still would have been an incarnation. It's not the, the sex uh, that determines the incarnation, <clears throat> but it's whether it was a human. But understanding now that regardless of the fact that Jesus only called males, which was in accordance with that tradition historical precedent, precedent, that came to an end. That's why, you see, to extend the criterion for apostleship based upon maleness, even the number 12, is futile. The idea that there had to be 12, where'd that come from? Their, their relationship to Jesus as 12 was severed. Only after the resurrection did he reconstitute them and breathed upon them. He said, now, whatsoever sins you've forgiven on earth are forgiven in heaven. So uh, the reconstitution of apostolic authority takes place <coughs> through death and resurrection. There, there can be no attempt, I think, to carry forward be, beyond the cross any of these criteria make them normative. The new humanity of Jesus Christ and the eschatological reality of his coming, eschatological reality is normative for us. This is simply a model that explains why today in our church we speak of ordination of women as a, uh, a possibility. Now, uh, there are many other implications of this, but let me uh, take the last uh, 10 minutes or so just for some uh, reaction discussion. I've laid an awful lot on. This is a 10-week course you've had. Uh, any particular question of clarification? Any question of application? Yes? My question is about what you just said about him being crucified biologically. And what I've understood and what I believe about Christ is that he was fully in touch with being female, even though he was biologically male. And how would you explain that about um, having his biological maleness crucified on the 
Well, my point of the biological maleness being crucified is only the crucifixion of uh, biological maleness as a cultural, even religious uh, criterion for authority and power. It's one thing to be biological male. It's another thing to be biologically male in the culture in which because you are biologically male, you are immediately given privileges and perks and positions of authority. Now, that whole way of, of, of enthroning maleness in a culture with power is what I'm talking about. It's pretty obvious to see that Moses' law of divorce only applied to men. Men were permitted to divorce their wives, not the reverse. Showing again that even that, that uh, particular advice of Moses was in recognition of the fact that, that it's a culture dominated by males. Uh, male fathers uh, made arrangements for their female daughters uh, to be married and had control of them until they gave more of the control of another male. So it's that patriarchal uh, control of the culture that I think did not exist uh, prior to the fall. I think uh, Adam and Eve, as the two male and female, emerged simultaneously, mutually. There's no concept that one is there first. If you really look exegetically, as we've said, uh, that, uh, that the author intends us not to draw the conclusion that you have a perfect male. It just lacks a female. So the argument that the, the male is first uh, falls on that. But after the fall, of course, the Hadam creature now gains, and Tribble says it's interesting, after the fall, it's no longer Ish Isha, it's Isha woman and Hadam creature. So the, the, the earthly creature Hadam takes precedence over the woman Isha, and only in redemption is Ish Isha, male and female, fully brought back again. So that's my only point there, that Jesus certainly uh, had within him, to some degree, as uh, most of us men, some feminine characteristics. Of course he did. But that's beside the point. We don't look at the masculinity of Jesus and look for feminine attributes to try to equalize this, any more than to try to put feminine attributes in God somehow balances this. No, the, the Bible uh, really destroys for us any types of uh, uh, stereotypes and any type of trying to import into God some systemic male or female. What we have in God is a perfect polarity of being of which we are the image, but we live that image out in the biological condition of being male or female within this lifetime. Any other? Yes. All right. One of, one of the things I'm wondering is you talked about the little antecedent. You, you used this passage um, about the male being like all that being equal as one antecedent. It sounds like you've also talked about Phoebe and other people in Scripture. Can you talk about the need to continue to use the little antecedents in a culture that you're beginning yeah. to say, why do we need to? Now, let me. As I hear your question, you're saying, why, why, uh, how can we prevent people from simply dismissing the scripture as irrelevant in the favor of uh, principles of equality and social justice and uh, non-discriminatory practices and so on? My answer is that, first of all, the degree to which we have been bound to use scripture to support a kind of typical hierarchical male-female type of structure, both in the church and in the home that we use the Bible to reinforce male headship, the degree to which we have exhausted the content of the Bible with regard to that issue in supporting a particular structural inequality. The only answer to that is an ideological claim that if that's all the Bible has to say is to support patriarchal, uh, uh, hierarchical role structures in male and female, then I prefer to go to principles of fairness and equality and human rights uh, on that issue. So what has happened is, tragically enough and ironically, orthodoxy by insisting on a literal rendition of the Bible and a proof text approach has created the culture by which people are uh, free to dismiss the Bible as irrelevant. 
My approach is to say, no, we have to have a third alternative. We have to say that the agenda of ideological feminism is the right agenda to have equality. But a better way to reach it is a biblical kind of uh, theology here, where we see that there is a biblical antecedent for that, and that the outcome of ideological work is usually um, strife, confusion, and it's power-oriented. So the way uh, our ideology works is we have a balance of powers. You know, the reason that we justify maintaining a nuclear arsenal is balance of power. We don't trust each other. And we have uh, uh, the, the, the male-female ideological issue is the equivalent of the nuclear arsenal. I have a, um, a friend who's taking classes at the master's degree level at Azusa Pacific College in their education program was telling me that many of the adjunct teachers at Azusa Pacific, a Christian college coming in out of the state educational system, are doing virtually nothing but bashing white males in their class saying that uh, until we get rid of white males, white males is the problem. The Constitution itself was a creation of white males, and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, bashing going on, and there's some concern about that, because uh, the, the way to correct a power imbalance is to gain power. And if you can emasculate a person who has power, you can take over their power. Well. Uh, that's desperate, and that's, that's why I think a better alternative is a theology, not of uh, equality of power, but a full freedom and equality of personhood. Power is not the issue, but personal dignity is. My responsibility is not to treat you as a woman, but to treat you as a human person. If I treat you as a woman, I have to have some type of stereotype in who a woman is. I have some idea, well, because you're a woman, you probably feel this way. Because you're a woman, you probably expect this. Because you're a woman, I should treat you differently just because you're a woman. That perpetuates that problem. Now, if I treat you as a human being, it's your responsibility to be a woman. Don't treat me as a male. Treat me as a human being. If you treat me as a human being, uh, I will uh, take responsibility for her. I use my maleness inappropriately. If I treat you as a woman, you can take responsibility for using your femininity inappropriately. And we can meet then with perfect respect for each other as male and female, but because we meet primarily in respect of our humanness. But ideologically, we have said we have to meet each other uh, as male and female and balance the power. That's why the discussion on the campus here of unity and diversity argue that uh, if you only have diversity as a maintenance of equality of representation and underrepresented minorities lack power, uh, you may gain power and you may gain recognition of diversity, but at the expense of unity. If we realize that the fundamental core of our being is not our ethnicity or skin color, it's our humanness. And that if we respect each other's humanness, then the the differences and, and nuances of our ethnicity and skin color will make a contribution to the mosaic of humanity. Uh, but we have to find a theological approach to unity and diversity. Too much of the discussion I have heard has been ideological, balancing power. And that usually ends up in some type of uh, either Cold War or uh, nuclear uh, catastrophe. <laughs> yes? Yeah, Go back to that idea of barrenness that you're saying. A barrenness, yes. Yeah, and could you give some examples of what it looks like for an individual or for a church to embrace barrenness rather than say, uh oh, we're dying, we better do something mm -hmm. about this? That's a tough one. It's easier theologically to have a theology of barrenness than to uh, you know, describe it. It's, it's the opposite of pornography. Was that I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, it's, easier, it's easier for me to define it than to know it when I see it. Uh, I think that one of the tests of the kind of barrenness we're talking about is the uh, using of the Ishmael, oh, that Ishmael might live before you, the attempting to uh, maintain uh, a success-oriented program where, in fact, it may be succeeding, but by its very success, it is barren. I've often said with Pete Wagner, if, you, if you're sure that a church ought to grow, you go to Pete Wagner, he'll help you to tell it how to grow. But the question of whether a church ought to grow is not a matter of church growth strategy. Uh, there is a growth that is malignant. 
And there is a kind of perpetuation of growth, which in the end is barren because it, it lacks the character and quality of life. Not that smallness is always good. So it doesn't, it, it's not that barrenness often is identical with failure. Barrenness can also be found in success. Ishmael was a great success for 13 years. But I had to go back to what God's word was. You know, start with the, uh, the barrenness. When Robert Schuller started his uh, theater, or he started his movie on the top of an outdoor theater, he started with um, you know, uh, what was impossible. This is possibility. You think something is incredible, and you simply believe that God will bless it, and God did bless it. So it starts out with, uh, with, with impossible thinking, doing what's impossible. And then later on, all the literature becomes possibility thinking. If you just think of what all your possibilities are. And so uh, what can begin as an Isaac born out of nothing can become an Ishmael. And uh, you better not touch the Ishmael. You better not, because uh, Ishmael is a big success. But yet it may be barren. So you, you have to define barrenness theologically as that which uh, bears the fruit of, of God's uh, uh, work. It's like the scripture uh, the, 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 the fruit that, uh, that Jesus brings, it comes from a, a good tree. A, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, Matthew. Jesus quotes Matthew. Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. But what constitutes good fruit? Well, a ministry that's successful but is dehumanizing to the staff and to the people working in it is a barren ministry. The degree to which Fuller Seminary has succeeded in three schools, and uh, that does not uh, mean it's going to escape barrenness. Uh, the degree to which uh, we systematically dehumanize for the sake of uh, counting numbers and things, uh, we come close to barrenness. Fuller Seminary started with uh, four faculty meeting in a a potential in a hotel room in Chicago saying, uh, uh, we think that uh, God's leading us to, to create a new seminary in the West Coast. And uh, these men came out here and they, they rented facilities uh, and, and used the Lake Avenue Congregational Church for a while. Uh, there were 30 some students in the first class. Uh, three of those faculty came out here, had to surrender their ordination credentials. They were Presbyterian. Presbyterian said, you give up your ordination credentials or leave Fuller Seminary. And they gave up their credentials because they believed in the future of Fuller Seminary. Finally, Fuller Seminary, after the years, began to achieve its uh, um, accreditation with the Presbyterian Church for the most part. And today, we can place our Presbyterian graduate. When I was a student here in the 50s, if you were a Presbyterian, you, you, you had to go to Nebraska to find a place where they didn't know much about Fuller Seminary. You couldn't be placed here. And many of them had to go on to a Presbyterian seminary. Well, uh, that was a very uh, a fruitful barrenness. <laughs> because people are ready to die for it. I don't know of anything now anybody here is ready to die for, and it scares me. When I was a student here, there were people dying for it. They knew what they're dying for. Yeah, we're evangelicals, so is everybody else. Kierkegaard said, if everybody's a Christian, nobody is. You know, so uh, that's one way that we began to, to define the theology. Okay, our time is up.